Okay, uh, so this is Dr. Morton uh, doing the lecture for Micro 1 um, for the uh, 5th of November. Wow, it's already the 5th of November. Amazing. Um, okay, so anyway, here's the uh, syllabus. So 5th of November. Uh, I'm going to talk about the KL25C. And um, so that's uh, kind of its, well, the programmer's model and some of the some of the architecture and, and features. Okay, so um, the KL25Z that we're going to use is 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 uh, on a freedom board, and I'll, I'll probably mention that too. Okay, so um, let's see. So um, yeah, so I'll do that. So what I want you to know is uh, I might ask a few questions just from this lecture, so uh, so you can review this video, and I'll, I'll review it before the final exam. Uh, but the most I'll do is just ask you a few general questions about the KL25Z. We're not going to do the KL25Z labs. I mean, you're welcome to do them if you want. You can go to the parts bin and buy the Freedom Board and do the labs. But I'm not going to require it because uh, we're already having enough trouble just getting everybody uh, provided with uh, the hardware they need just to get the, uh, the nine labs that we did with the PIC board done. All right. So anyway. So... So that's kind of where that stands. All right, so uh, so let me, um, let's dig into it. We'll get rid of this and we'll start. So, um, let's see, oh, there you go. this is easier old. Um, so, so, so let's talk about the Freedom Board. So the microprocessor that's on the Freedom Board, actually there's, there are a whole bunch of Freedom Boards you can buy with different microprocessors on them. But the original, very first Freedom Board that uh, Freescale ever released, uh, of course, they are now, they were bought by NXP, they're now part of NXP. That that Freedom Board had the KL25Z128 VLK4. And uh, that that chip uh, is the one we're gonna talk about. Um, it is, it's it's what's called one of their kinetic, kinetic, uh, kinetic L-series devices. It is an 80-pin low-profile quad flat pack, so it's a, it's a surface mount part, and it has 80 pins, 40, uh, 20 on a side, four sides, and um, it 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 is a 32-bit ARM Cortex M0 core. Now the Cortex M0 is the entry-level M series processor that that ARM makes. Now remember, ARM doesn't make they don't fab any silicon all they do is uh, is lease very log files uh, and maybe some of them are vhdl files or maybe they're only vhdl files but i think they're mostly very log files to uh, various uh, manufacturers who then integrate their own peripheral parts and their and their own other features into uh, into this uh, with this arm core and then they actually make uh make the make the chips uh, so some features are kind of optional to implement, and so some of them get implemented, some of them don't. One of the main features that was not implemented by Freescale uh, in, in this KL25Z chip is that it, they didn't implement uh, having two uh, stack pointer registers. Uh, they, there's just one stack pointer register that's implemented, and that's fine. Uh, it does mean that uh, it, it, it makes it a little less powerful uh, when you use it with a real-time operating system. So that's about the only downside. And I don't think, uh, in, even in Micro 2, we never really use it with a, with a real-time operating system. But if you were going to use it with a real-time operating system, that would be an issue. Okay. Sorry. So, um, so it, it is a 32-bit core, and it does have 32-bit uh, data bus in, included, and it actually has a 32-bit address bus too. Now, the, uh, the, this is a, uh, a von Neumann type machine. So all the program memory, all the data memory, all the special function registers and control registers for the, for the peripheral modules and for the chip itself, they're all mapped into into this 32-bit address space, which 32 bits gives you four gigabytes, and that's an awful lot of memory when you only have 128 uh, k of flash and you have uh, I think 10 k of RAM. 
no, sorry, 6K of, of static RAM. So, uh, and maybe a few K tied up in, well, maybe more than that, but but we have some tied up in these in, in these special function registers. It, it this chip can run up to 48 megahertz in operation, and I believe it has a 48 megahertz clock on it. It has some special features for fast single cycle I/O, and uh, that's actually a confusing part about the documentation because it it it, ha it actually maps your peripheral ports into two different areas of memory. Remember it's got it's got a four gigabyte address space and it only and it doesn't even have a megabyte of stuff to address. So it has you know it can address thirty two thousand megabytes. So it, it can replicate whatever it wants to address thirty two thousand times pretty much. But <clears throat> so it, it, it has several places where it stores the, uh, the, the registers. And one of those places is this high speed single cycle I.O. access and the other is not. And but I have never found in the documentation which one's which and how you differentiate between the two and what the what the, what the actual impacts are differences between the two. It, <clears throat> the documentation for this chip is 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 is. Uh, arcane to say the least. It's difficult to digest. It's very detailed and complicated. And uh, Lord save you if you're trying to, to sort it out because it's really hard. The, um, the other thing that complicates the documentation is that the, that, the, uh, that the CPU manual is an ARM manual. And so is the, and, and of course all the assembly language instructions, that set, it's an ARM instruction set. But the actual chip has a whole bunch of freescale, what used to be freescale modules on it. And, um, and so, so the, the primary manual or data sheet that you need is a freescale data sheet, now an NXP data sheet. But if you need some of the features that are part of the actual core, then you need to go look at the ARM documentation. And for sure, if you, you had the tremendity to, to ever want to try and program an assembly, then you definitely have to dig into the uh, into the uh, to the ARM documentation. So this makes it really challenging to know where to look for certain information. Um, <clears throat> okay, so again, I, I mentioned it has 128 kilobyte, kilobytes of flash. So it has a lot of program memory for an embedded uh, chip uh, for, a, for a micro uh, controller and six kilobytes of static RAM. So that's actually pretty good. Uh, it does have this power management and mode controllers. We'll talk about that. Um, so this power management mode controllers and the low leakage wake up unit. So what we mean by low leakage wake up unit, uh, when you put the chip into the sleep mode, that, then it uses very little power and that's what we call low, low leakage wake up unit. So, so integrated circuits uh, primarily draw power when they're running and they're switching. When they're not switching, then what power they draw is called leakage current. Now, an interesting caveat is that as your chip gets, uh, as your feature size gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, we used to make, I don't know, 300 nanometer features, and then we started making 150 nanometer features, and then slowly now we're making 10 nanometer features in some advanced products. But 12 nanometers isn't super rare. I think this one is probably 28 nanometer technology uh, are, are, well, maybe not. It may be, uh, maybe more than that. But in any event, um, the smaller the feature size, the more the leakage current is. So there's kind of a sweet spot where you, you get uh, really good circuit density, and but you're not, but you haven't ramped up the leakage current. Okay, it also has this BME, the bit manipulation engine, and that's that, that's, that's this feature that does these fast read, modify writes for the peripheral pins. Again, hard, very hard to figure out how we're supposed to use this. Now, this chip has a direct memory access controller. It's, it's actually got four channels of DMA controller. And what DMA does for you, it allows, it allows for a peripheral device to, uh, to bring things in from memory directly um, without having the CPU involved. Uh, uh, well, or, or you can store things in memory. So for instance, you can have your D-Day module can be uh, automatically 
D-Day values in, and as soon as it brings in a gets a completes a conversion of say a 16-bit D-Day conversion, then it can store that uh, in a in a defined memory area, and it can do it through your DMA controller so that this the actual uh, system program, your software that's running doesn't have to do anything except once it sets it up this can all happen automatically and then it can just go to these buffers and fetch the data out uh, without without ever having to have taken the time and trouble to load the data in the first place it also does have a we call it a watchdog timer in the pick world but they call it a cop timer but it's the same idea uh, the, the cop stands for computer operating properly whereas watchdog means it's a little module that that can can be programmed and set up so that it'll that it'll reset the chip if it gets hung up. The COP does the same thing basically. It has an extensive um, system clock generation module, and it is able to use uh, frequency lock loops and phase lock loops in conjunction with external circuitry to generate all sorts of internal clocks synchronized with those external clocks. So it's a very powerful uh, clock module. It does have some built-in 4 meg and uh, 2 kilohertz internal reference clocks. And then it's got this low power 1 kilohertz uh, RC oscillator for real-time clock and in, uh, in, in computer operating properly uh, controllers or timers. It's got a bunch of peripherals. Uh, the analog peripherals, uh, it's got a 16-bit ADC. It uses the same technique as the microchip as our PIC chip does, the SAR, Selective Approximation Register. It has a 12-bit DAC with DMA support. Oh, and the, and, the soda, and the ADC has DMA support as well, which means you can, you can directly write things uh, from your... Once you do a conversion, you can automatically write it into memory. Uh, the 12-bit DAC, I guess what that means is you can have, uh, you can have uh, memory set up and you can automatically pull stuff out of memory and set it to the DDA controller. You can basically use that to, to uh, set up uh, the data in memory to basically generate a uh, arbitrary waveform if you wanted. And then it has high-speed comparators. Uh, on the communication side, it has two uh, serial peripheral interfaces. So that would be like, uh, that would be like, um, Let's see. That would be like um, these are these are these are the parallel uh, interfaces where they're basically all well they're serial, but they're moving eight bits at a time, and they take a few more wires. Whereas here you have two I squared C modules, so you actually have four, uh, you know, com you know, com ports where you can talk to other integrated circuits, and then it has USB capability, so it, it can actually host a uh, it can host a USB. Uh, uh, master uh, function. It can actually be dual role. It can, it can be, uh, it can be either. Uh, it's, they don't use the term master and and slave, but it's kind of like that. And uh, and it has a built-in uh, USB voltage regulator that'll provide five volts at up to 500 milliamps. Again, uh, two SPI and two I squared C modules. It's got this low power tick timer, which is kind of cool, and a system tick timer. It's a separate one. Uh, well, that's a system tick timer. It has this low power timer as well. We'll talk about that. It has uh, it has a bunch of GPIO pins, so it's got a ports A, B, C, D, and E. Now each port has sort of the sort of the accompanying registers that are 32 bits, but but not all 32 bits are implemented in any of the ports. It has ports A, B, C, D, and E. Only only about uh, 12 or I I forget I. I there's not many more than 12 pins in any port, and most of the ports have fewer than that. Uh, and they're not in order. Uh, the, the, the pins, you know, jump around. So you might have, like, um, you might, might have port A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, and then you might skip to A15 and A16 and 17, and then A27, 28, 29, 30, 31. It, it's just hard to say. It's all over the place. And... Uh, so it's kind of that part's a little strange. It does have a capacitive touch sensing module, and then on the on the on the actual Freedom Board itself, it has an external chip that's a three-axis accelerometer, 
uh, it has a, a built-in capacitive touch slider all set up, and it uses that in conjunction with its uh, 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 w with its other um, capabilities. So you can you can use the touch slider. Uh, you can set that up with the uh, touch sensing module, and you can you can move you can move your finger back and forth and and change the intensity of a color or something like that with the LED. It does have a red, green, blue LED, and uh, and then it has a couple of I.O. headers on it that are compatible with Arduino uh, I.O. headers. Um, so uh, I'm not going to talk about the tower board. We have some of those in the lab. If you want to check one out, you can use it. It's very similar to the Freedom Board. It's just that it's, it's a little bit it's a little bit different and it has instead of an RGB LED it's got an orange a yellow a red and a green all separate LEDs it, it has it doesn't have a capacitive touch slider it's got two capacitive touch switches where you put the LED underneath so it's kind of cool um, it does have an IR uh, transmitter and receive pair and it's got this uh, 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 potentiometer on it it's also got two push buttons and then it has the USB roll interface. But the real advantage of the tower board, it has these edge connectors that allow you to, to connect all sorts of additional uh, boards to it with, the, with these side pieces called elevators. In any event, uh, it's kind of unwieldy and we, we really haven't used it all that much. We pretty much, once we got the freedom boards, we kind of got stuck on them. Okay, so um, the core is a 40, 48 megahertz ARM Cortex-M0 Plus. And, um, the, these are, but all the peripheral modules are freescale. Okay, so anyway, um, so, so just, I, I put this up, but it's so out of date, it's pathetic. Practically every micro uh, processor producer now uses ARM cores. Um, so, and a bunch of these don't even exist anymore, like Atmel now belongs to Microchip. Microchip's not on this list, but they are now because they bought Atmel, and they and Atmel makes a whole bunch of ARM core chips, uh, or, or did. All right, so let's look at the programmer's model, and then I think I'm gonna wrap this up a little bit early. Um, so here's here's what the CPU looks like. It has, here's the, here's the core where it crunches the instructions. It's got this really fancy wake up interrupt controller interface that wakes it up from sleep. And it and it can go into a whole bunch of different levels of sleep. Unlike the PIC chip and the sleep lab you just did, it's either awake or asleep. That's not the case uh, with the Core M0 Plus. It, it has about five or six different levels of sleep. And then it has this, when you do interrupts, it doesn't just have a single address in the memory where it transfers control. It has a vector table, and it depends on what caused the interrupt and based on, on, the, on the source of the interrupt, it will go to a specific address associated with that source and execute the interrupt routine. Now that, that table in memory is populated by what are called weak aliases. So what you do is in your program, you use the same name that's in the interrupt table and it overrides the weak alias name that's in the interrupt table, and then it, it basically substitutes your routine's address for the, the weak alias address. And the weak alias address if, uh, is, just a, is just a return from interrupt. I mean, it doesn't do anything except clear the flag and return from interrupt or something. So, so, uh, so basically, this means that when you execute an interrupt, you don't have to try and figure out what interrupted. You automatically know because that's the address transfer that was that the that that is executed based on what caused the interrupt, and it's really nice. And the other thing that's nice about the uh, the nested interrupt, so the vectored means it has a vector table to point to the right routine to run based on what what causes the interrupt. Nested means that you can assign different levels of priority, and you can nest interrupts. So if you have a low priority interrupt running, and then a, a medium priority interrupt interrupts, it'll start. It'll interrupt the low priority interrupt routine and run the higher priority interrupt routine. And then if you had a higher priority come in at, after that, you would interrupt the medium priority and 
do the higher priority first, then it would finish, go back to the medium, finish that, go back to the low, finish that, and then go back to the to the inline routine wherever it was processing when the interrupt the very first interrupt occurred. So it's so you can nest interrupts, which is kind of nice. Uh, it has this memory protection unit, which allows you to partition out parts of memory and then protect them from other programs. This is if you want to run a supervisor. If you don't run a supervisor, it doesn't really make that much difference. Uh, and then it has a high-speed uh, light bus interface, uh, advanced high-speed bus light interface, and and then it has this special uh, uh, low latency uh, response time for the GPIO pins. And then it's got some really powerful debug features all built in. Uh, it's got a separate debug access port, so it does not have to put in special code. This is always available. And then it has... Uh, and then it has uh, micro, uh, a micro trace buffer, so it, it can actually trace through back through several instructions. It has multiple breakpoints, and it has it has the ability, in theory, with if you have the right programmer connected, to uh, to watch variables change in real time, which is really cool. So you're so you don't have to stop it to look at a variable; you can actually watch it. Uh, although I've never I've never implemented that because it takes the standard programmer we use. Uh, on the Freedom Board doesn't support that, apparently. All right, so so this uh, so this low latency I/O interface, that's this single cycle access to I/O up to 50% standard than standard I/O. Um, so it gives you faster reaction time to external events. It does have two-stage pipelining, and and we have two-stage pipelining in the PIC chip too, as a matter of fact. Um, it has it's all of its instructions are 16-bit, uh, except it's got six 32-bit instructions. But but it it gets better code density because uh, some of the other uh, ARM assembly languages can have multiple eight-bit uh, uh, multiple byte instructions that that take up maybe 32 bits or maybe even more. So so the the thumb zero plus uh, the thumb zero or the, the yeah the thumb the thumb uh, system I forget the name of it now I'll get I'll give it to you in a minute it it uh it's it has less code density anyway and then it it does have uh, it it does have uh, this optimized access to program memory and it also has the this uh, DMA access the the uh, the, the ARM Cortex M0 and the subset of the ARM Cortex M3, M4, it, it can reuse existing compilers and debug tools. So there's quite a big ecosystem associated with ARM cores. And you get, if you're running an ARM core, you get access to that to some degree. It does have 56 instructions. That's very similar to the 49 that the PIC has. But it has quite a few more registers. Uh, the PIC's got one working register. Now, of course, this PIC is a low-level chip, uh, and and it's not a 32-bit chip or anything, whereas this is clearly a you know a more advanced chip. Uh, microchip does make those kind of chips, too. but it, So we're kind of comparing apples to oranges, so it's not entirely fair. But this has 17 registers, uh, and it does give you... Uh, you, can, you can move data around in bytes, half words and 32-bit words. It has this linear four gigabyte address space, which is nice. So you don't have to do memory banking. You don't have a bank select register or anything like that. Cool. Not call. Anyway, uh, so it has good debug features. I mentioned the micro trace buffer. Uh, that's actually a big deal, which I've never actually used, but it's it is it has real uh, additional debug capability. And this uh, this BME, this is another interesting thing. Uh, it has what are called decorated stores and loads, which you can do to the uh, to your peripheral registers. Uh, and it's fairly complicated. I've never used that either. 
but um, it does allow for this uh, uh, for single cycle stuff uh, that where you can actually do ands and ors and all sorts of things with bits in a single instruction um, and it's quite fast it does have four channel direct memory access I mentioned that earlier and then it has very very low power uh, sleep modes which is great um, again this I think we've gone over most of this uh, yeah this is just repeated um, it does have some pretty powerful timer modules uh, so unlike the our little pick chip it's got separate timers for the DMA it's got several timers or several timers for PWM it's got several timers for the for the uh, uh, for the A to D converter uh, it's got special timers which are uh, really handy for system uh, functions like the periodic interrupt timer and some other things um, and then uh, any of the any of the peripheral pins can generate interrupts. Uh, that's a little different. Pit in the pick, most of the pins can, but uh, but none of the C port pins can on our pick. Only the A and B ports. Um, it'll operate from 1.71 voltage, so it'll go a little lower. We're, ours will go down to 1.8. The pick will, but uh, this can only go to 3.6 volts. Um, so this is just a different uh, functional block. It's very similar to the one we just looked like at. So I'm not going to go over this. And here the here the programmer's model. I'm going to cover this and then I'll quit. So we have 13 general purpose registers for data operations. So we have one W register. This has 13, but only the lower eight, R0 through R7, are available to most of the instructions. Only some of the more fancy instructions, I think the six the the 32-bit instructions, uh, take these uh, can get at these upper five registers. Um, then it has a stack pointer. This is very different than the PIC. The PIC does, has a has a 16 level hardware stack, so it's got somewhere it's got a 4 bit stack pointer that's also fixed. Uh, but this one has a 32 bit register, and you can specify any address and random access memory to be your stack. So you can relocate the stack, and and the M0 Plus has the ability to have a a master stack and a process stack, but they only implemented the master stack. On, on the uh, on the KL25Z. And then it has this link register which helps in subroutine calls and function calls and other things. And then it has a program counter which of course every chip does. And it's 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 32 bits. So it can it can count anywhere in the 32 bit linear uh, gigabyte address if 4 gigabyte address memory, 4 gigabytes of address. And then it has a program status register that has uh, four status bits. Um, including a v-bit which tells you if you have two's complement overflow and then it has uh, uh, a couple of other things the control register uh, has to do with what stacks being used if you had implemented both stacks but again not implemented on the, on the freedom board um, here this just this says the same thing again and here's some other register. I'm not going to go through those uh, and I already mentioned the, the nested vectored interrupt controller that has up to 32 external interrupts, each with four levels of priority. And then it also includes some some system interrupts for like trying to divide by zero, trying to do a, a non-memory aligned uh, word, half word or word operation, and some other things. Uh, and some of these are just used if you had a if you had an operating system running. And it has this really good debug support uh, with up to four hardware breakpoints, two watch points, uh, and then it's got uh, it's got this this uh, program counter sampling register, so you can actually see what's going on. You can sample the program counter, uh, and you can single step it. Uh, you have unlimited software breakpoints, which is nice, and then it has you can actually uh, you can actually see uh, variables change in real time if you want to set that up. But you have to have a little different uh, interface programming interface than we have on the freedom board all right so and again it, it has a 32-bit data bus and a 32-bit uh, slave port and um, and then it has this this optional single cycle IO port I am not sure whether or not this was really implemented that's a good question actually all right uh, I think I'm gonna I think this really the the instruction set is really not set for writing uh, hard uh, writing 
uh, code uh, in assembly language. It's really it's really designed to be C, to implement C instructions because it's really optimized for C and it's not really set up for hand coding. It's missing some of the instructions you'd like to have if you were going to do hand coding. Um, all right, I think I'm going to. Uh, we'll go through the instruction set maybe uh, maybe next week, but uh, but I'm not going to say a whole lot more about this. I think I'll pretty much quit with this, and that'll do it.